Good morning, everyone. My name is Noreen Humble, and I'm the acting director of the Calgary Institute for the Humanities. Before we get started with the 40th Community Forum, I would like to take the opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the Blackfoot and the people of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, which includes the Siksika, the Picuni, the Kainai, the Tsutsina, and the Stony Nakoda First Nations, including Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nation. The University of Calgary itself is situated on land adjacent to where the Bow River meets the Elbow River, and the traditional Blackfoot name of this place, which we now call the city of Calgary, is Mokinstis. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories, we acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. And I would also like to acknowledge the diverse traditional territories of those of you participating in this broadcast from elsewhere, wherever you share in the bounty of Turtle Island. The CIH is the oldest humanities institute in Canada. It was founded to support the study of the human experience beyond what the social and natural sciences provide. And it has, long, has a long history of civic engagement and of hosting events which bring groundbreaking scholars and scholarship into conversation with the broader community. It supports humanities research both within the university and without, and this community forum is our annual flagship event. The community forum was established specifically to bring together scholars and community participants to discuss key and pressing societal problems. Since its inception in 1981, we have missed holding a community forum only once in 2020. Though the state of the pandemic is far worse here in Calgary now than it was a year ago, we were determined to go ahead with our event this year, not least because the topic, the death of expertise, question mark, which we had set for last year, continues to be as timely and important as it was when it was first proposed nearly two years ago by our wonderful advisory council, uh, prominent community members, all of whom support and advise the Institute in a myriad of ways. When the topic was first chosen, we were already facing unprecedented questioning of traditional sources of authority in all sorts of areas, from steadily increasing denial of climate change, increasing vaccine hesitancy, and an alarming acceleration in the election of populist politicians. The pandemic has in many ways only exacerbated the situation in the sense that this increasing questioning of traditional sources and models of authority has uh, more immediate life and death implications. At the same time, however, we can chart a long history of act activist movements in the past century that have challenged the perceived blind spots of traditional expertise and authority, whether this is feminist questioning of male bias in science, AIDS activists challenging medical uh, orthodoxy for access to drug trials, or indigenous groups protesting against engineering mega projects or paternalistic development schemes. And this leads us to pose such questions as, is the current perception of the death of expertise overstated? Do our conceptions of expertise need to change? Are the current challenges to expertise part of a healthy public sphere or a sign of a dangerous slide towards populism and demagoguery? These and much more um, are some of the questions that our panelists today will examine and which you will all discuss afterwards, challenging our current experts here to address your concerns and queries about this topic. Before we get started, I have uh, two introductions to make. Um, first, I am uh, delighted to invite to give a few words of welcome, Professor George Kolpitz, the Associate Dean of Research in the Faculty of Arts here at the University of Calgary. Thank you, Noreen. Um, it's very, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and um, say a few words. Um, I, I don't think it's any exaggeration to say that, um, well, uh, for quite some time, uh, we wait with anticipation uh, for the CIH to make its announcement of what its uh, annual community forum will be. And uh, so it, uh, it was a great pleasure to see the message come out about um, the assumption of this, uh, this forum and um, it taking place um, despite 
the difficult circumstances that you were highlighting, um, they've really become must attend events, at least for me and many within the University of Calgary and within the community of Calgary. Uh, I speak from my own experience that attending these events um, enlarges my mindset. Um, it certainly um, uh, makes, more, makes me more sensible uh, and empathetic or sympathetic uh, towards uh, complex issues that um, are facing our, our society today. And it's, um, it's certainly a pleasure for me on behalf of the Dean's office. And um, I know that uh, Richard Sigerson uh, sends his regrets for not being here, but um, is so supportive of your work uh, to congratulate the CIH on its work at the University of Calgary and especially its work within the larger community. Um, the CIH and its um, acting director, Noreen Humble, uh, we thank you. I know that Jim Ellis, officially on leave, continues to uh, do his contributions to the work of the CIH and uh, Sean Lindsay, all should be congratulated, but so should be the hard work of the executive uh, council as well as the advisory councils. And all of these people bring new ideas and talent to bear to see that the CIH remains. And well, I'll just say it, it is one of the most vibrant intellectual hubs at the University of Calgary and within the city of Calgary itself. Um, so they must all be thanked for uh, events like these, but also the backdrop work of the, the Institute over the years. I also want to thank donors who support this type of work. Uh, at our recent Giving Day event, um, I found it absolutely touching um, and, and meaningful that despite um, our ongoing crisis around us, donors were so generous towards the CIH. They continue to see the importance of critical uh, research in the humanities, uh, in, in inquiry towards uh, the hum human society and uh, culture, uh, that they continue to provide uh, dollars towards this type of work, uh, towards the scholars in residence, um, and towards events like these. So I really thank um, the donors that have stepped up and, and really provided generously to this type of work in our, in our, uh, in our community. And um, certainly I think the CIH deserves thanks for its, inter its efforts in inter interdisciplinary research, um, supporting critical humanities inquiry uh, in its annual fellows uh, and hosting events like these. Um, these really show the relevance of the study of human culture and society in the grand challenges of our times. And I can't think of a more important theme that, uh, than the one that's shaping today's discussion, the end of expertise. I know that uh, we grapple with this, uh, this issue in our classrooms, uh, in, our, in our teaching at the University of Calgary. Uh, I think we, we scrutinize our, uh, on a daily basis our, what we are reading in social and news media. And uh, I think I'm speaking from experience, and maybe some of you share this, that I've had a couple of really interesting conversations in grocery store lineups with fellow Calgarians around this very issue of who is an expert and who is the authority to trust in our times around us. Um, of course, at a two meter distance. But um, so I would just like to thank again, Maureen, for inviting me here today. I congratulate the CIH on its work and um, I really look forward to hearing from our um, very amazing speakers. Um, I really enjoy hearing from Jim Brown, who remains my favorite uh, radio host and authority uh, on CBC. Thank you, Jim, for being here. I miss waking up to you, Jim, uh, on the CBC more. I still miss waking up to you, but at any rate, I, I send my best wishes to you, the speakers, and to everyone for joining us today. I hope we have a very fruitful and uh, um, challenging, but also um, valuable discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, George, for your kind words. Um, we're delighted that you're able to be with us today and very appreciative of the faculty support and promotion of the Institute uh, within and without the university. Um, just before I, I introduced you all to our special guest moderator uh, for today's forum, I want to just set out a few general points of procedure. 
Um, as most of you know, today in Calgary, schools have closed down. And this has thrown many people's schedules into disarray. Um, do know that you can come and go as needed. Our very capable technical expert, uh, the CIH coordinator, Sean Lindsay, will keep an eye on the waiting room to make sure to let you back in if you have to leave for any reason. Um, further, and partly for the same reason, during all sessions today except um, the breakout groups, everyone except the speakers will be muted so that nobody needs to worry about any unexpected interruptions. Um, the chat will also be disabled um, until the final session. During the Q&A, we'll open up the chat, um, but do keep in mind uh, that although we will do our best to incorporate um, any comments and questions in the chat into that discussion, there may not be enough time to address everything. Uh, with the, it's, you know, there are limitations with this format. We're delighted to be going ahead online, but there are limitations as well. And we're conscious of not wanting to lose your goodwill and attention by going on too long um, as well. So I hope you bear with us uh, with patience and, and goodwill as we en embark upon uh, this event today. So um, we're delighted to welcome back Jim Brown as our moderator today. He performed this role with Verve and Aplomb for our 39th Community Forum in 2019. Jim is the author of The Golden Boy of Crime, the almost certainly true story of Norman Red Ryan, published by HarperCollins Canada in 2019. He was radio host of The Morning Show in St. John's before moving to Calgary to host the eye opener and uh, making George's mornings perfect uh, on CBC uh, from 2003 till uh, 2011. And, the, and uh, he hosted the National Public Affairs Program, the 180 on CBC Radio One from 2013 to 2017. His first film, the feature film Radiant City, co-directed with Gary Burns was presented in September 20. Uh, 2006 at the Toronto International Film Festival and won a Genie Award for Best Documentary. Um, they collaborated again in 2010 on the feature film The Future Is Now. Prior to joining the CBC, uh, Jim has worked extensively as a newspaper reporter and magazine editor and I know that you are very much going to enjoy um, uh, his uh, moderating activities today. So Jim, I will hand it over to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Noreen. I, I, I can promise Verve, but I, I don't know if I can promise a plum. What, what a great topic, though, isn't it? I mean, um, what a, I, I was thinking I would open up today by, by talking about what perfect timing it was that we were doing this topic right now with everything that's going on. And, and then I started thinking about it more and, and I realized I could have said the same thing last year. I could have said the same thing five years ago. I could have said, I mean, it's always, it's all, it always seems unfortunately lately to be a perfect time to be dealing with the topic that we're dealing with today. But um, I do know that, that Sunday morning as I was walking through my local park, which has apparently become a, a regular weekly anti-mask, anti-lockdown protest site, I happened to be passing just as this guy was getting up to address the crowd and he began his remarks by saying, okay, I've been researching these spike proteins. And I thought, oh, this is beautiful. This, this, is, this is beautiful. Now I've got an anecdote to open, uh, to open Friday morning's conference on the end of expertise with. So uh, anyway, it, it is a particularly interesting topic at a particularly challenging time. Really happy with all three of the speakers that we have with us today. Uh, each speaker is going to uh, talk for about 20 minutes and then I'll spend a few minutes asking a couple of questions based on that talk and then we'll, we'll move on to the next one should wrap up the, this session around mid-morning uh, when Noreen, Noreen will come back, we'll have a break and, and, and she'll tell you what the breakout sessions will, uh, will involve. But our first speaker today is Harry Collins. Harry is a distinguished research professor and directs the Center for the Study of Knowledge, Expertise and Science at Cardiff University. And uh, his talk today is called Expertise is Not in Conflict with Democracy. It is essential to democracy, in fact, it is essential to humanity. So uh, please join me in welcoming Harry Collins.
Right. I think now you should be able to hear me and see my slides. Has everything worked? Great. Uh, let's go to the first one. Uh, it's decided not to work. There it has worked. Okay. Um, I'm an academic. I've been, I'm a sociologist of knowledge. I've been studying the nature of uh, science since 1970. Uh, and I was one of the pioneers of what became known as social constructivism. And for anybody who knows the history of this kind of work, I was on what many people would call the wrong side during the science wars. And I was roundly attacked by many scientists uh, for claiming that science was a much less certain business than it was usually presented as being. Um, and uh, so I was a sort of bad boy uh, up until about the year 2000, um, when I was worried about the revolt against mumps, measles and rubella vaccine. And myself and a colleague, Rob Evans, wrote a paper saying, look, if science studies, as it was called then, or the sociology of scientific knowledge, carries on going in the direction it's going, then we're going to destroy the distinction between scientific expertise and ordinary opinion. And this isn't going to be very nice if that happens. And we explained the, the various reasons why this would be the case, not least that we'd lose our own jobs since we were only paid because we were supposed to be experts. And um, we wrote the paper and uh, ever since then, I've been fighting people who say this paper is wrong and that we've got to stick with the old ways of supporting the democratization of science and uh, supporting the value of ordinary folks' opinion uh, as regards uh, uh, what's true and what isn't true, even on technical matters. Um, so we wrote this paper and we wrote various other papers. And then uh, I was a, a bit of an outsider in my group. And then Donald Trump came along and in a sense did my academic position and those of my colleagues quite a big favor because it then became obvious that what we were saying had some truth in it. Um, that Donald Trump was against expertise and most people anyway thought, well, Donald Trump is not what we want the future to be. And I have to say, as far as I'm concerned, that night in November, when it looked as though Donald Trump was going to win re-election before they counted the postal ballots, was probably the most, no, well, it was, it was the most frightening day of my life. I'd had more frightening moments, like when I had a car crash, but it was the most frightening day of my life because I couldn't see how the future was going to unfold in any satisfactory way if Donald Trump won the second term. And um, I'm still nearly as worried because I know that the uh, voting preference figures in the US haven't changed that much. Um, it's still possible that he will win re-election or somebody like him will win re-election in 2004. And you should understand my talk uh, in that context. Why is expertise vitally important? And, and you, you need to realise this because a lot of my colleagues were telling me at the time when Trump was gaining salience that it's nothing new. All politicians are liars. You know, uh, Nixon was a liar, a great big liar, and Trump is just continuing to tradition. But that's to misunderstand what was going on. And uh, this was captured by de Rochefort's uh, remark, hypocrisy is a tribute that, tribute that vice pays to virtue. So Nixon, of course he was a liar, but he tried to hide it. He tried to be a hypocrite. And to be a hypocrite is a virtuous position regarding the truth, because every time you're hypocritical, you're showing that you value truth. But Trump wasn't a hypocrite. Trump said, look, I'm telling you a lie. 
and you can see I'm telling you a lie. And that's I can do that because of this political power I have, because I represent the will of the people. And I think Trump is the first Western leader, whatever that word means, since the 1930s to abandon hypocrisy and attract truth head on. Trump was attracting anything that could be a check and balance on his power, claiming his will was the will of the people. That's what populists do. And counting all else as treasonous. He and his supporters claim, however, that he was fighting for freedom. And I'm going to try and say that this is not a supportable position. It's not a supportable position because we don't have freedom. Uh, human beings are not free. If you want to test whether that's true or not, um, anybody can test it. So, and, well, you're all muted, so you won't be able to test it. But you can try, say, mm, the cat sat on the mat in Japanese or Chinese or some other such language, and you'll discover you're not free because in fact, your native language speaking abilities have been given you by your upbringing. And most everything else you know, and most every, every other expertise that you have has been given you by your upbringing. And without that upbringing, you wouldn't have any capabilities. You would be like a feral child, somebody had been brought up by wolves. Uh, no language speaking abilities, no knowledge, no nothing. So this is my model of society, it's what I call fractal model of society. And it consists of expert groups embedded within another, within one another in very complex ways. Up at the top are what I, we call ubiquitous expertise. So in that big oblong there in that big oval there natural language fluency is one of your ubiquitous expertises you're very fluent in language far more fluent than any current artificially intelligent computer whatever people tell you uh, and it's a tremendous expertise which is very hard to get to grips with um, another thing you understand is how close to walk to walk to people on the sidewalk uh, depending on whether it's crowded or not depending on what time of day it is and depending on how many people are walking towards you and all the other sorts of things that make it possible for you to live in society then underneath this are all the small expertise as you'll see there are scientists there there are fortune tellers there there are farm workers there and so on uh, next slide so societies are not made up of individuals they're made up of domains of expertise. Different societies are different according to the domains of expertise of which they're made up. And individuals are combinations of a subset of such expertises as are made available in their society. That's what a person is, a set of expertises. Here's an image, a cartoon of a person. That's you. OK, and it depends which bits of society your arms and legs in that kind of cartoon stretch across, which determines who you are. There's no pure freedom of choice. Human abilities and choices are enabled by society. Now, uh, in, in one of my books called Rethinking Expertise, also written with Robert Evans, we have a thing called the periodic table of expertises. And there it is on the top left hand side. Side On the top line, there are the ubiquitous expertises that are in the top oval of the fractal model of society, which is in, on the bottom right of this slide. In the second line down, there's membership of expert groups like physicists or doctors or fortune tellers, actually, because that's a skill as well. Uh, and uh, in the in the third line down are what's called meta expertises, and meta expertises are very very important. Meta expertises are our abilities to know who to ask if we want to know the answer to a technical question. So 
part of my meta expertise is that I know that if my car breaks down, I should take it to a garage. And if my health breaks down, I should go to a doctor, not vice versa. I was taught all that in my upbringing. Uh, and uh, that is that meta expertise is a ubiquitous expertise as represented in the yellow box in the bottom right hand corner there. And what my talk is moving towards is saying we've got somehow or other to reestablish the right ubiquitous expertise is in society. We can't teach individuals to understand the content of all those little expert groups. That's far too hard. But we've got to under, we've got to teach people to know the right places to go if they want to get technical expertise. So the key for citizens, I'm going to say, is civic education towards understanding the nature of democracy and the role of experts within the fractal model. Now, we recently wrote a book manuscript in which we invented the idea of what we call, I mean, sorry, we invented the idea, invented the name, popular assertive democracy uh, for the kind of notion of democracy that populists hold. And that is the model where every individual citizen is free to make whatever choices they want. Uh, and this is this model is supported by freedom of fear and calling anything that involves groups socialism. It supports the idea of the will of the people, which is established at an election. And it supports the idea of distrust of expertise because distrust of expert, sorry, expertise is something which stands in the way of the will of the people. The will of the people is represented by whoever wins the election, the government, the government that wins the election and experts can stand in the way. For example, Donald Trump said that uh, uh, Americans shouldn't wear masks. Experts said they should. So experts are treasonous. Uh, and one um, supposed solution to this difficulty is that the democratization that's put forward by my colleagues in social studies of science is the democratization of expertise, but I don't think it works. There's the fractal model of society, which I've been talking about. And this gives rise to what we call structurally constrained democracy. Instead of thinking of society being made up of a lot of individuals, think of it as being made up of a body of expertises. These body of expertises are act as checks and balances, and the checks and balances support diverse, in, diverse interests. So at the time of an election, some people lose, but the checks and balances support the interests of the losers of an election. So they're not completely set in entirely to one side and they disappear. Checks and balances depend on elite experts. We'll see in the next slide that people mostly understand this, at least when it comes to the law. And absolute freedom, on the other hand, as I've said already, implies unformed, feral individuals with no substance. Can you resolve the problem by democratizing expertise? I'm far too, I'm an expert on the nature of science and you can't, science is incredibly difficult. Even scientists are always arguing about the truth. So ordinary people aren't going to know enough to be able to get right into the science. I think there are people who could help and we can come to that later. I said experts stand in the way of popularizers. This is a headline from the right wing British paper called the Daily Mail, presenting some judges who said that uh, Johnson had to take the Brexit decision to Parliament before he made it. And they were those judges were described as enemies of the people by the Daily Mail. Uh, and um, that's the most crude example of what I'm saying, that experts stay, stand in the way of populists. I don't think you can have a lasting democracy unless people understand this. 
and I think you'll see that the idea of democracy is being under attack by people describing democracy as something where individuals have absolute freedom to choose all the time. Sound knowledge, if you study science and see how scientists make knowledge, you'll see it depends on face-to-face -face interac interaction. What scientists do, and I spent 45 years immersed in the group which discovered gravitational waves. In two, uh, the, the discovery was announced in 2016. They did it by keeping themselves together in small groups with, with well-guarded boundaries, arguing like hell among each other, and eventually forming consensuses which move things forward with all sorts of resignations and sackings and things like that along the way. But it was within small and bounded groups. I was the only non-scientist in those groups. And science, science, one of the reasons that science can claim to make sound knowledge is because of this trust that's generated in face-to-face -face communities. Science is not perfect. Uh, science has often been defended on the grounds of its perfection, but it is not perfect. It's, you see that scientists, even, science, even the scientists who discovered gravitational waves disagree. There are still scientists who think, well-trained scientists working in scientific institutions who think that gravitational waves have not yet been discovered and that the work was flawed. Nevertheless, that's the best we can do. Science is craft work with integrity. So let me go a bit faster. This is the danger. The model on the left, the little figure labeled A, is one of those expert groups from the fractal model of society with its tightly guided boundary. Model B is a group which is being invaded by uncontrolled inputs from the internet, such as you get if you're exposed to social media continually. Model C is what bounded group A turns into if it's continually exposed to all kinds of outside influence from the internet. Model D, figure, sorry, plate D, is the fractal model of society, a sketch of it. Plate E is what it looks like if all those little groups turn into those sea-like features. What you get is an amorphous mass and power is precipitated to small, powerful groups, financial or otherwise. That's my talk, we've somehow got to avoid that shift to the society represented by figure E. Very interesting, Harry. Thanks so much for that. It's a couple of follow-up questions before we move along. Um, you, you talked about the fact that, um, that you don't believe we have real freedom because we don't have the expertise to know and or do everything that we might want to do. I'm curious, the, the, the ignorance, the, the dishonesty that you talked about being displayed by someone like Donald Trump, that ability to lie, even though he knows everyone knows that he's lying. Can we see that in, in a sense as a sort of quest for, free, for, the, for the freedom that we don't have? It, it, it's a quest to expand the domain of his freedom. So he doesn't have to be uh, confronted by experts. But it, it's... The, the point is, he's. it's rather that he supports this uh, attempt to expand the domain of his freedom by claiming that in a good society, everybody has freedom. And that's just factually incorrect. It's obvious that it's factually incorrect. As I said, you can prove it's factually incorrect just by trying to speak in a language that you don't know. Or any other... You know, play a bit of virtuoso violin right now. You're not free. There's all kinds of things you're not free to do. And the model of uh, society, which people like Trump want to promulgate, which is that we are all free, 
It just doesn't work. I mean, it just doesn't correspond with reality. Sadly, the space we're in right now, Trump could pick up a violin, scratch away for five minutes and say it was a virtuoso performance and upwards of 70 million Americans would all nod yes. Now, you, you, Sadly. you, you said you said we can't resolve this problem by by democratizing expertise, but but surely education must play some role in the solution to this before we all turn into amorphous blobs like slide C. Yeah, but the education has to be the education in who to look to for the best kind of opinion on technical matters. I, you know, civic education is what we need. We need more of it, but we need people to understand what democracy is and what the role of experts is. It's, again, it's inconceivable. I spent 45 years studying uh, the detection of gravitational wave physics. I wrote four books about it, one of which was nearly a thousand pages long. So supposing, can, can we say to ordinary people, you must do this if you want to understand gravitational wave physics. Of course not. People understand very little domain. Even within science, people only technically understand very narrow little domains. Most of the gravitational wave physicists who I studied, a thousand of them or so, didn't, were not able to do each other's work. They pretty well understood each other's work because they spent... They went to conferences three or four times a year, talking to each other, learning the practice language of their scientific domain. But you cannot have ordinary people do this. It doesn't but make can sense. you not educate ordinary people, to use your phrase, to a degree that they would at least have the ability to know where to turn to receive expertise? Well where to turn to get the best possible opinion. It's not the case that they're going to, as it were, reason through the science. That's too hard. But yes, where to turn to get the opinion. I do think there's a sort of in-between category of people. I mean, people who mediate between the experts and ordinary people, uh, and that includes journalists and politicians honest politicians. And one of the problems, for instance, you can see this because one of the problems with the revolt against mumps, measles and rubella vaccine was that the journalists didn't handle it right. The journalists treated, they tried to get balance between the view of Wakefield and the parents who saw their own children becoming autistic after they were MMR vaccinated and the epidemiologists who were pointing out, and, and the other scientists who were pointing out that MMR vaccine did not cause autism. They tried to get balance. But if those journalists, and I think they're all capable of doing this, had just read Wakefield's paper, as I did, and I'm not an expert in this domain, but I know enough elementary science. I learned enough in elementary science at high school to be able to see that Wakefield's paper did not support his thesis. There just weren't enough subjects in it. There were about five kids he looked at. And he was saying, well, these kids uh, have measles va vaccine in their gut, so MMR might be causing autism, these autistic kids. Uh, but he was still favouring injection with measles vaccine. So his whole argument didn't make sense, and the numbers were far too small. And anybody with an elementary training in science could see that. And I think the journalists could have delivered that. And they didn't. And I think certain honest politicians could deliver that kind of thing, too. All right. Thank you, Harry Collins from the University of Cardiff. And we'll be hearing more from Harry uh, later today when we pose questions from your breakout sessions to all of our panelists. But now it's time to move along to our second speaker today, Maya Goldenberg, who I, I know I've interviewed at least once. Maya is uh, Associate Professor of Philosophy at the University of Guelph with a cross appointment to the Bachelor of Arts and Science program and graduate faculty in the Institute for History and Philosophy of Science and Technology at the University of Toronto. And her talk today is called, Is the End of Expertise a New Problem? Maya Goldenberg. 
Okay. Um, well, uh, thank you. Thanks for this opportunity to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak about the the end of expertise and uh, to be part of this uh, to to be part of this uh, forum. So, uh, so my question was: Is the end of expertise a, a new problem, or you know, the alternative is 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 it uh, more of an more of an old problem? So. Um, uh, as philosophers often do, I'm a philosopher. We start at Plato and we move from there. So um, uh, I'd like to say that philosophers since Plato have, have framed a tension between democracy and truth. Uh, the general concern, the tension between democracy and truth is that uh, the masses lack the intellectual refinement to discern matters of truth and govern themselves accordingly. So the Western canon, is full of ideas about how to how to protect the public from themselves. Now, the so-called masses have at times objected to being seen as incapable, and and populist movements have arisen uh, that decree experts as being out of touch elites. Uh, I want to ask the question: uh, Is the current worry that we've reached? the end of expertise, more of that same perceived tension, or is there something different about the current situation? And also, it uh, doesn't matter, how does this assessment um, as, as more of the same or as something different, how does that inform options for resolution of uh, the problem of expertise? So first, just to how, how I define the end of expertise, is, uh, is that it's, it's a complaint. It's expressed frequently by science communicators and by political watchers. Uh, the complaint is that nobody listens to experts anymore uh, about climate change, about vaccines, about uh, multinational trade policies um, and, and, and many more things. Look where we are now for all the promises by world leaders during this pandemic that they were following the science, uh, expert advice was still often, often ignored. So the expression, the end of expertise, captures a host of pressing concerns. Um, how will people make good choices? How will they make informed choices? Uh, how will people come to agree on anything? And without good answers to these questions, the worries that democracy unravels from one of rational rule by the people, so the people making good rational choices, into some kind of governing by the whims of the mob. And society would likely will likely collapse when there is no widespread agreement possible. There's been uh, on the end of expertise. There's been a flurry of writing on the end of expertise. It's been it's pressing now, but it's been uh, it's been uh, pressing for a number of years, as as uh, as our moderator uh, first first said. Um, the politics of Brexit in the UK and Trump in the US are held up as exemplars of the end of expertise, or some people call it the death of expertise. That sounds a little more dramatic. So if you think back to these two events, this was 2016, these were two lead stories in global politics where the public seemed to ignore the advice of economists who thought leaving the EU did not make good economic sense. Meanwhile, in the US, at the same time, the public, at least parts of the public, didn't seem to care that the presidential candidate and then president didn't know much about policy and had no experience in government. So I just uh, want to remind you of a few solidifying moments. Um, uh, so I captured a few, just a few screenshots here. Uh, there was this moment when uh, asked on live television to name one economist that supported the UK's exit from the European Union, we had Conservative MP Michael Gove, who was a supporter of Britain's departure from the European Union, made the famous response, I think people in this country have had enough of experts. Um, similarly, Glyn Davis, another uh, Conservative MP, dismissed lack of expert support for leaving the EU. He tweeted in October 2016, personally never thought of academics as experts, no experience of the real world. Uh, move over to America, then presidential candidate, this was Donald Trump, was echoing this view. He told an audience in Wisconsin, in April 2016, uh, I'm quoting Trump here, they say, oh, Trump doesn't have experts. You know, I've always wanted to say this. I've never said this before. With all the talking we do, all of these experts, oh, we need an experts. The experts are terrible. 
So what are the politicians doing here? They're rejecting elite values. Uh, experts, they say, serve the interests of the rich and powerful rather than the interests of the common people. So Gove and Trump, they were styling themselves as the people's politician by maligning experts. Now, those who lament the death of expertise or the end of expertise say this charge of elitism is surely untrue. Uh, some experts might be corrupted by political or corporate interests, but experts who do their jobs well are at the service of science, facts, and truth. And by rejecting experts then, the public are turning away from science, facts, and truth. And this is dangerous because even if we disagree on political issues, we need facts and we need science as our common ground. So experts are, are framed here as purveyors of facts. They, uh, they provide the social and political glue that makes constructive political deliberation possible. Once we lose that grounding in science and facts, is we fall into chaos. So, so failure to recognize the rightful place of experts is what we're calling the end of expertise. Now, pol political scientists call this turn away from experts epistemic, epistemological populism, or oh, I see I wrote epistemic, I meant to write epistemologic populism, but they probably both work. Um, when we talk about populism, we usually think about political populism, which challenges the elite's political power. Now, uh, epistemological populism challenges knowledge elites or, or what we call experts. It, it exalts the folk wisdom of the common people. That's the usual rhetoric about uh, the common man and what they think. So, um, I'll give you an example. Um, during his short tenure consulting to the White House, the white supremacist Steve Bannon would frequently speak of the working man's truth. That's the same idea as, as epistemological po populism. So why are we now embroiled in a politics of knowledge and a conflict over expertise? Why are we in a post-truth epoch or the end of expertise? The answer is because democracy and experts have an uneasy relationship. They exist in a kind of tension that we're still working on. We're still trying to, to refine it and get, get right. So let's look at the two ends of, uh, imagine an expert run society. We call that a, te a technocracy, that's the term for it. That would be a society run by experts. And that might sound appealing at first because their knowledge and their intellect and their skills could result in very well thought out policies. So that, that might sound appealing to you, but Rule by experts is not democratic. Uh, experts, of course, are an elite group because they have specialist knowledge. They have knowledge that not everyone has. Um, and uh, in other words, specialist knowledge is, is, is predicated on not everyone having it. And because of that, not everyone gets a say. Only the few decide because they are qualified to do so. Um, even if our expert decision makers were elected, their pronouncements and their decisions would not be and, and even shouldn't be responsive to the political will of the majority public. So there's something undemocratic about technocracy ruled by experts. But let's go to the other end where we want to really heighten democracy by getting rid of experts. Um, that's the populist suggestion that we should be doing that. But, but ridding de democratic politics of experts is not clearly a good solution either because democracy can get dangerous if there's no rational grounding for political decision-making. So letting the people decide can lead to bad decisions. So that's the tension between the two extremes and we're trying to get somewhere in the middle, right? So um, the, the perceived tension between democracy and truth is, is not new. Um, I wanna take you back to, uh, to Plato, the ancient Greek philosopher who was worried about this very problem. Uh, his concern was specifically about written communication. Uh, writing, he, he said, would mislead the masses because writing lacks the context and care of oral communication. And he was thinking specifically about the kind of guided learning that teachers like himself could do at the Academy of Athens. That's a school that Plato founded in, in the fourth uh, in the fourth century BCE. Um, centuries later, I'm taking you to 15th century France. 
the, the first commercial printing press, the, the Gutenberg uh, press, it ger generated that same moral panic that the European masses could not handle more access to information. Jump ahead to the 20th century, which gave us the internet where anyone could be a knowledge contributor. Well, you get the picture. The worry has been that the, war that the public cannot handle new uh, access to information. Um, I'm, I can't talk about all those things. I'm going to go back to Plato uh, a little bit more. So, so um, back to Plato, uh, he wrote through the figure Socrates, and he, he raised the alarm about this threat to truth, as he saw it, that was posed by the invention of writing, and, and of course, by those who would read the writing. So reading and writing were, were at issue here. Um, writing, um, the problem was that writing cannot discern between the readers who can understand it and benefit from this communications and those who will be totally misled and confused by it. So Socrates warned us in, uh, in the Phaedrus that writing reaches those who understand it just as much as it reaches those with no capacity for understanding. And Socrates assumed that in the wrong hands, a little knowledge was a threat to the social order. So Socrates' uh, disapproval of written text was based um, in part on a conviction that the pursuit of the truth was so demanding that only a few Athenian citizens could be trusted with this undertaking. Uh, he insisted that knowledge is not something that can be captured in words. Knowledge requires long and continuous exchange between teacher and pupil. Um, and, and it's only then that true knowledge can, can find its way to the soul. Uh, I'm paraphrasing from the Republic here. Uh, Plato's main concern appears to be not so much with the written text, but with its circulation to mass audiences. So let's bring this to current time. Um, today, the, there is the norm of inclusive democratic public cultures. So Socrates' inclination to restrict people's freedom to read material uh, and material of their own choosing is, is anathema. But even in the 21st century, the public is often represented as a mass of powerless victims of media manipulation. Uh, the public is said to be led astray easily by tabloid journalism, by the techniques of advertisers. That's a common concern. And of course, such concerns have been amplified in the age of the internet where the communications landscape has gotten so much more complicated and, and faster. So Socrates' worry about the threat to the social order, that specific concern, should actually resonate with the concerns of today. That I don't think we've moved past. Um, that's exactly what contemporaries are saying about the tragic end of expertise about why science denialism is terrible and, and the whole problem of post-truth. Post-truth, in case you didn't know, was Oxford Dictionary's word of the year in 2016. Um, in generally, humanity as we know it is under existential threat. And it's for that reason, because of this post-truth problem that we now march for science and we lament the harms of a post-truth world uh, on the screen here, I've got a, a Washington Post opinion piece reflecting on the storming of the US Capitol building by, the, by an angry mob in January of this year, January 2021. So thinking about that, how we've characterized things like storming the Capitol building in what's supposed to be sort of a global pillar of democracy, the US Capitol. There were many ways to interpret those hardships that the US was feeling at that moment, the social divisions, the violence. Uh, it could have been the harms caused by income inequality. It could have been political injustice. Uh, it could have been many sort of political problems. Instead, the, the takeaway line, the focus has been on truth and science as the missing part of social cohesion. So Plato's warning seems to be still heard here that the democratization of knowledge is dangerous. That's what the problem is. So these populist movements that brought us both Trump and Britain's exit from the EU um, is in apparent rejection of, of the cultural values of the political establishment has, has prompted renewed concern about the supposedly fragile status of truth. That's the post-truth problem and the threat that democratized knowledge brings to it. So democracy and truth are still in tension. Um, and that's because the masses cannot handle 
uh, the unregulated uh, creation and proliferation, proliferation of knowledge on, on social media platforms. So truth, uh, once again, the suggestion is truth, once again, needs to be constrained. Uh, pupils need to be guided much like Plato caution, Plato caution. So the public need some kind of learning and guidance. So the, the, the solution to a post, the problem, if, if we call this problem post-truth, the solution seems to be resituating and reinstituting of experts as the purveyors of truth, as the givers of expert knowledge, um, and, and, and recognizing that experts are crucial to rather than counter to democracy. That's exactly what the first speaker, uh, Harry Collins, was arguing for. So um, how do we work out uh, the, the rightful authority of experts in the context of democracy? So going back to, to Plato again, um, Socrates's critique of the capacity of people to distinguish between truth and falsehood, the, their inability to do it well, I should say, uh, led him to recommend uh, that we needed the authority of the would-be, that what he saw as the experts of the day, these were the philosopher guardians, these were the the, the most esteemed, most knowledgeable people, the guardians, they should rule. Philosophers, as he said it, have moral expertise. They've got sophisticated understanding of justice and aesthetics. And that made them the people most likely to know truth, to be the purveyors of truth. And therefore they were the right people for political rule. They were the experts. So, so Socrates openly derided the authority of the Athenian demos, that's the public, um, because the people were not intellectually equipped to grasp the truth. He promotes deference to experts. And as far as he's concerned, what most people think on moral and political matters is, is far less important than the views of, let's say, one person who really understands the issues that are at stake. That would be the expert. Of course, this doesn't sit well today. Uh, and because it is an unambiguously undemocratic. And you know, even Socrates ran into, ran into difficulty when he tried to find that qualified philosopher guardian, the moral expert to guide people towards truth. Uh, the philosopher guardian was, was an ideal, an idea about the optimal ruler when, and the actual on the ground candidates didn't actually hold up to scrutiny. So to sum up uh, Plato uh, via, or via Socrates, Plato saw a contradiction between democracy and truth. Uh, the concern was, what's that the concern um, that we talk about today, what we now called fake, fake news and, and post-truth politics was bound up with a worry about the capacity of ordinary people to discriminate between what cultural elites interpreted as truth and other versions of reality. So how much of that has actually changed? Um, well, it's only in modern times that we've shifted away from uh, uh, the focus on, on moral expertise of the philosopher to the factual expertise of scientists. So when we talk about experts now uh, ruling or, or having some say in, in governance, we talk about scientific experts, not the broad moral experts. And the thinking there was that the quest for political experts are thereby resolved. Uh, the factual experts can, um, of course, bear very circumscribed circumscribed technical expertise, and they can inform political judgments that way. So what we've got is de democracy is retained in that way. It, can be, it remains intact when experts advise, but experts don't rule. So we end up with political legitimate and scientifically informed policy. And that seems to be what we want right now. So this means that public life in demo democratic societies is predicated on uh, deference to experts on the matters of truth, where, and then you let the people and their elected officials do the rest. So that's a presumed division of labor based on this division between truth and, and politics. Now, is that satisfying? Well, here's the worry. Okay, so experts may not have the last word on topics of public interest or, or matters that are relevant to people's private affairs. And that seems good for democracy. It's a shift from what Socrates was promoting. But there's no question that the technical pronouncements that our experts make today shape the political possibilities that are, are available for democratic consideration. So even if they're just technical advisors, they are excluding some policy options and elevating others. So experts are politically influential. Um, so it really shouldn't be a surprise that the specialist knowledge of experts 
is now contested once again. So what is now called a post-truth uh, or, or post-fact is an exhortation to accept expert, genera expert generated facts as true and to accept the political constraints that follow from accepting those facts. So insisting that everyone should agree on facts because they're just facts and to trust science because it's, it's science after all, it obscures the politics that follow from accepted facts and what gets called scientific. And when we further consider that a lot of scientific claims are ambiguous and contested, there seems like good reason for political actors and public people to keep an eye on the facts. So that's not just to guard against bad actors that manipulate the facts to serve their interests, but it's because the facts are not always as clear as they seem. And to say they're just facts and therefore they must be accepted misses that. Um, think about our pandemic experience. We've had a continual barrage of emerging scientific evidence that gets shifted. We get changing public health advice. We see disagreements between scientists so the facts are not so secure, um, even before they are get channeled into politics and policy. So um, what about the experts? I'll, I'll wrap up by bringing it back to experts. Remember like that Socrates couldn't locate the moral expert that was singularly, singularly equipped to guide civic life. And we today similarly struggle with a smattering of localized experts even if they're good, uh, they're, they're uh, usually scientists with expertise in their own highly specialized slice of science, but their lack of breadth, they don't have the breadth to pronounce on complex social issues, which need multiple disciplinary considerations, right? Like there's one, there isn't one expert that knows what we should do about lockdown. They can provide insight from their field of research. So this is to say that we don't just need to resolve the tension between experts and democracy, but we also need more consideration about which experts and why in order to get us to resolve the tension as it, as it sits today. Um, okay, I'll stop there. I think I've asked more questions and offered answers, but I'll, I'll stop there and say thank you. All right, thank you very much. It's Maya Goldenberg from the University of Guelph. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in the idea of um, what happens in a society. You talked about the importance of having a, a sort of basic level of deference to expertise. What happens when we lose that basic level? And, and how do we get it back when there are so many elements of that society that for, what, for, what, for whatever reason, whether they're trying to sell vitamin supplements or whether they're trying to get elected, have a vested interest in increasing our distrust in expertise. Right. What, what you're describing is that uh, expert expertise has been politicized just as science and facts have been politicized. There isn't an easy answer about what to do with that. I will say they say the doubling down on facts and science and marching for science doesn't quite do what we're what we're looking for. I, I'm not a relativist about scientific claims. I wholeheartedly agree that uh, science offers the best methods of getting us towards the right answers, but that doesn't mean that we're going to get those right answers all the time. And it also doesn't mean that everything follows from getting the right answers, right? Our, our, our policies, uh, the ways that people's lives are impacted by them. There are many non-scientific considerations that go into policies. So even if we have the science 100% right, it doesn't mean that the, the right policy just follows fr from there. So I mean, what we need to do is, is uh, I, th I think, focus on sort of trust and social solidarity issues. You know, when I, when I think about, you know, the storming of just because we had that example, the storming of the US Capitol, there was a lot more going on there than post truth. And to say that it's because some people read something on the internet, it just doesn't, and, and, and of course there were active disinformants telling them that the election was rigged and that kind of thing. But there was so much more going on there than that. There was disinformation, but there's also uh, a culture of, uh, of, of um, not trusting certain sources, of polarized news landscapes, of um, deference to, uh, to certain authorities, right? It is true that they would that those followers would believe anything that Donald Trump says, and it's true they don't care that he lies because he's allegedly speaks some broader truth that isn't captured in 
factual claims. So as, as puzzling as that is, it means it tells us that the reliance on the security of facts is, is not the problem. It's that we've got gr greater social divisions that need to be addressed and we have to pay more attention to those rather than, uh, rather than um, double down on science and facts. But you, you talked earlier in your presentation about the, the great fear that we'll end up in a situation where we're being governed by the whims of the mob. And it occurred to me when you said that, that most of those whims don't come from the mob. Most of those whims come from outside the mob and then are adopted by the mob. Right, uh, right. There's media manipulation. All those things are, are, are true. So I, I agree with most of the characterization of, of things that even Socrates was offering. And since then, that, that there's... Uh, uh, active disinformation, there is manipulation by uh, vested uh, interests, and there's a there's a, a publics that are struggling to find their way. And I, I I don't think science is going to secure that. But what what we could do is think about why it is that something that was once sort of left on question. So science, I, 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 you know, I'm a philosopher of science and philosophers of science will always say science has always had values. Because of that, there have been political interests in, in science. It's not to say that science is biased by politics, but it is shaped by politics nonetheless. So we need to think, what are the values that are shaping our expert institutions, uh, our scientific uh, governance and, and things like that? There is certainly, you know, if you if you listen to the co complaints that are being made by the people who are rejecting scientific claims, it, it, I mean, it sometimes takes a veneer of we don't believe science and I think I know better more about spike proteins than you do, but it's usually some kind of broader social critique that science is serving the interests of power and not the interests of the people. So I look at what does that mean to say serving the interests of power and what are the power interests that uh, that are being uh, amplified in, in government policies and which ones are being suppressed. There's still so much to follow up on here and, and hopefully we'll get into more of it in our conversation following the breakout sessions. Maya, thanks once again. That's Maya Goldenberg and uh, now it's time to introduce our third speaker this morning. Stephen Sloman received his PhD in psychology from Stanford University in 1990 and began teaching at Brown University in 1992 where he is currently Professor of Cognitive, Linguistic, and Psychological Science. And Stephen's presentation today is, Do We Trust Experts? And if not, why not? So here's Steve Slo Stephen Sloman. So the, you almost had the title right. It's actually, Do We Trust Experts? Why not? Which I, I thought was slightly more clever than yours, but yours was probably more accurate. Um, so thanks very much for the invitation, and thanks for... Um, I've already learned a lot this morning from two excellent, sophisticated speakers. Let me see if I can get my slides up. Can you see them now? Okay, great. So I do fashion myself a scientist. So upon given the task of talking about the end of expertise, I thought I should um, look up some data so uh, I went to Pew and I found out um, what they think Americans think of experts. Um, and the story actually, I was a little surprised. The story isn't quite as sad as the picture that's been painted so far this morning. Um, so what you can see here is that Americans really trust the military. Um, half of them a great deal, half of them a fair amount. And their trust for scientists isn't that much lower. Their trust for medical scientists is, is pretty good. Once you start getting to school principals, trust decreases a little bit. Uh, trust of religious leaders is surprisingly low. And then we start getting into the news media and elected officials. And of course, there's no trust there. Um, Here's some more data collected on the same issue. This comes from a talk I saw by Esther Dufflow, who won the Nobel Prize in economics recently. Uh, so you see pretty much the same picture in this poll that was uh, got done by YouGov, which is also supposed to be a representative sample of American citizens. And um, it looks like the most trusted group are nurses. Um, doctors, again, are pretty high. Scientists, still fairly high. 
uh, weather forecasters less so, sports commentators, now we're starting to see real mistrust. Um, nutritionists, pretty low, surprisingly. Now you get to economists and they're near the bottom, right? So economists apparently are not scientists. Um, Esther Dufflo is an economist and so uh, she you know, took issue with this. Look, that said, there are not surprisingly very intense political differences um, in the States, and I think also in Canada, uh, in terms of trust in scientists. Although even there, I was surprised by how small the differences were. So, you know, if you ask people what their confidence is um, in scientists to act in the best interest of the, of the uh, public, you can see that actually 82% of people who are Republican or lean Republican actually say there's, they have a great deal or a fair amount of confidence, which isn't that different than the 91% of Democrats. Um, how much you know about science tends to make a difference. The more you know, the more trust there is. Uh, but there's less of a difference than you might imagine. Where differences start arising, getting bigger, is when you ask, as, as Maya did, um, what role should scientists have in our society? And there you see a bigger difference between Democrats and Republicans. Scientists should take an active role in policy debates. Democrats, 73% of Democrats say yes, only 43% of Republicans. Scientific experts are usually better at making science policy decisions. There's a 20% difference. Scientists' judgments are based solely on the facts. That's an interesting kind of moral judgment that distinguishes Democrats from Republicans. Um, I would like to point out that everything I've just shown you has to do with explicit judgments of trust, right? How much do you trust scientists? Um, there's a sense in which that question matters much less than the question, do we in fact trust scientists when we're making decisions? That is, does trust have an implicit or, or do scientists have an implicit effect on the judgments and the decisions that we make, whether or not we explicitly trust them? And you know, I'll briefly point out that in, in some work I've done, it, there's an indication of a clear divergence between those two things. So even Trump supporters who say they don't trust scientists still get a sort of bump of understanding when they learn what scientists uh, believe, right? So if scientists understand, then people think they understand, even if they're Trump supporters who claim that they, that they don't trust scientists. There's a sort of commonsensical aspect here, right? You can say you don't trust scientists, but we all use our cell phones, our smartphones, our microwave ovens. Um, we all live in a way that requires a kind of faith in science. And even if we claim we don't trust scientists, we still use our microwave ovens, right? So there's another kind of faith that I think is worth keeping in mind. Okay, so the problem may be not quite as intense as we have thought, or at least as I thought before going into this, um, but nevertheless, there's no doubt that there is some lack of trust. So I spent a little time thinking about, you know, why I think there's that lack of trust. What are the reasons for it? And Esther Dufflo in this uh, talk I saw her give recently gave one answer, which is that, uh, and I think Maya hinted at this too, um, experts don't always get it right. And in particular, economists um, are terrible at doing things like predicting recessions, right? So these data basically show that if you ask an economist a year and a half prior to a recession to predict whether there will be one, 
they're basically way off. They just they think there's going to be three percent growth when in fact there's 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 loss. So you know there's something to be said for what John Kenneth Galbraith said a while ago. The only function of economic forecasting is to make astrology look respectable. Um, and again, as, as, as Maya pointed out, uh, you, this is not the only example of failure of expertise, right? So we've seen a lot of failure uh, during the pandemic response. I mean, in some sense, we're still seeing it. We've seen changing advice come from the WHO and from the CDC. We've seen the CDC make very significant mistakes in like testing for COVID. Um, personally, I, I give them a lot of leeway. I, I do not take huge issue. I mean, they're doing, sci scientists are doing science and we're learning more and more every day about, uh, about the coronavirus and COVID. And so the fact that advice is changing is in a sense a good thing, but nevertheless, when someone isn't telling you something consistently, it's gonna uh, reduce your degree of trust in them. I think there are also social and psychological reasons for mistrust. So, um, you know, on one hand, there is the fact that our news sources have become incredibly polarized over the last 20 or so years. You can see it both in cable TV and social media, especially, although you see it in all media, the, the growth of the conspiracy theory industry is, is shocking, um, especially on the right. But I do believe that we see lots of biased news coverage by virtue of the fact that news organizations are appealing to smaller and smaller uh, audiences, to narrow and narrower interest groups. And not everything that we see is true. And it's also the case that there have been, there's been a growth in wealth and power disparities. And there are a, a number of groups in America, and I think in Canada too, that um, have come to have feelings of helplessness. Um, on the right, it has a lot to do with the emptying of, this, of small towns and deindustrialization, lack of opportunity, the fact that even religious organizations are often falling apart. On the left, there's the sense of systemic racism causing people to not trust society. Um, to some degree, academics like me are the problem, right? So uh, over the years, there's been a rise in the humanities and what's sometimes called critical theory, right? A sort of product of the postmodern view that, that questions whether truth even exists and explicitly questions the value of science, suggesting that it's nothing but a power struggle by scientists. Um, sometimes this is called cynical theory. I was uh, surprised, um, and I, I won't say delighted, I'm rather uh, upset to discover that my own field of scientific endeavor has recently been accused of being the source of the problem. So there's been a lot of work in the field of judgment and decision making led by um, Danny Kahneman, a Nobel, another Nobel Prize winner and his uh, um, collaborator, Amos Tversky. And what they've done is to convince a lot of people in the West to pay attention to academia that human beings are irrational, that we survive by uh, using heuristics, rules of thumb and tricks that um, allow us most of the time to get by effectively, but to lead to certain systematic errors, mistakes. And in that sense, there's a kind of fundamental irrationality in human beings. And I sort of grew up with this belief, um, and I think it's true, uh, but the claim has been made that it's, that the, the notion that human beings are irrational has come to pervade our culture and has made it impossible to trust others be, 
including scientists, because after all, scientists are human beings too. So what I'd like to suggest is a kind of um, analysis that is consistent with this last final JDM view of the nature of irrational human beings and say something about what it is about people that I think allows the kinds of ideas that we've been talking, that I've been talking about to take hold. Um, and so, you know, my first observation is that you don't have to study psychology or, or cognitive science very long to, to appreciate that people are not libraries of information and we're not calculators or computers that derive true theorems in a systematic way. Um, we're not storehouses of data nor objective assessors of it. I, so I'd like to sort of summarize the four of fundamental properties of human beings that I, that I think create bias. The first is that we tend to believe what we understand. So if somebody says to you, um, it's raining outside, most human beings believe, come to believe it's raining outside, right? You don't first say to yourself, I wonder what evidence this claim is based on. You don't evaluate it, you just accept it. And it turns out that we do the same thing even when political claims are made, even when claims are made that are very fundamental to our lives. Now that's true as long as the person isn't, as long as we're not hearing something that we already disagree with. Right? So we do live with what's sometimes called confirmation bias. Uh, we accept things that are unfamiliar or that are familiar and we believe, but we do respond negatively if we can tell that what the person is saying is inconsistent with something we, we uh, hold uh, that we consider valuable. Okay, the second observation is that people tend to focus on information itself and neglect its source. So it doesn't really matter who tells you it's raining outside, we're, we're gonna, we tend to believe them. Or if we're hiring someone, if we get a really positive letter about that person, then we'll believe the letter a little more if it's from a source that we're familiar with that we know and trust. Uh, and a little less if it's from a stranger, but that difference is actually very small. So the source of information tends to be underweighted in our judgments, and we just focus on the information itself. Third, we shouldn't think of information as, in, as sort of, of facts, right? We don't simply observe the world as data and take in what we see, but we rather interpret things in ways that are consistent with our norms and values and expectations. So if someone, if one person hears that, you know, 550,000 people have died in America over the past year, some of them will say, oh, well, it could have been a lot more. Thank God that you know, the Trump administration made sure that vaccines were created or we'd have a much bigger problem. And other people will say, that's terrible, that's awful. We could have saved so many hundreds of thousands of people if only we had taken a different approach towards the, the pandemic. So the point is that a fact is not a fact is not a fact but it gets interpreted in a way that's consistent with our prior beliefs. And more importantly, it gets interpreted in a way that confirms our identity, right? So generally we'll take facts and we'll understand them in such a way that we think the people around us will understand them because we want to agree with the people around us. It makes life much easier. We're less likely to become outcasts. And in fact, there's data showing that you can give people exactly the same data. And if they have opposing beliefs about the data, 
then they'll take the data and use those data to come to even stronger conclusions that are consistent with what they believe. So you can show a group the same data and find greater polarization in the group after they've seen that same data. Fourth point is what I'll call ignorance in the community of knowledge. And that's really the idea that I'm bringing to the table today. So it turns out that 54% of US adults believe the public should play an important role in guiding policy decisions on scientific issues. 44% say public opinion should not play an important role because the issues are too complex for the average person to understand. So I'm gonna agree with both of our previous speakers and say that these 44% are much more correct than the 54% who think the public should play an important role. And not only that, but we don't understand. So the public, sorry, um, the public uh, finds most issues too complex to understand. And the real problem I will argue is that they don't know, they don't appreciate that they don't understand the issues as well as they think they do. So I'm gonna to refer to this as the knowledge illusion. We think we understand things better than we do. It turns out this is true of common objects. So if you ask people how well they understand common objects like zippers, toilets, ballpoint pens, and then ask them to explain how those objects work, it turns out that people surprise themselves in their inability to generate those explanations. They think they understand how they work, but it turns out they discover they don't when they try to explain. And you can prove, you can find this out for yourself by first thinking, how well could you draw a bicycle? And then try to draw a bicycle. And my prediction is you'll find you have much more trouble than you expect because you think that it's a simple mechanism. After all, it's visible, right? You can see the mechanism on a bicycle. But when you actually try to spell it out, it turns out to be complicated. My colleagues and I have shown that not only is this true with common objects, this is, a, this is also true with political issues, right? So people think they have this sense of understanding, but when they try to explain how policies will lead to outcomes, they fail and they discover they don't understand as well as they thought they did. It's not good enough to ask people what their reasons are. People are great at generating reasons. These um, observations have to do with our attempts to generate explanations, not reasons, right? It's the attempt to understand the mechanism, how things work that confuses people. And that's the illusion that people live in, that they understand how the world works better than in fact they do. So what we argue in this book that's called the, the knowledge illusion that I wrote with Phil Fernback is something actually very similar to what Harry was arguing. That the reason that we fail to explain things and surprise ourselves by our failures is because we fail to distinguish what we know from what others know, right? When you ask me how well I understand a political policy, what I'm actually telling you is how well my community understands the policy. I don't appreciate the extent to which my knowledge about how a toilet works sits in the head of the plumber that I call when my toilet breaks, right? I use this thing on a regular basis. And so I feel it feels familiar and understandable, but it turns out that most of that understanding is sitting in the heads of other members of my community. Um, 
So there's lots to say about this. I think that's why one reason political debate has become so emotional. It's because when we're defending our view, we're not actually defending our own personal view. We're defending our community's view. We're defending the view of our people. And when we're defending our people or our family's position, you know, we care and we get very emotional about it. Um, okay, so there's lots more to say about this, but for lack of time, I'll just uh, show you one more finding and then conclude. So recently I've done some work with um, Nick Light and Phil Fernback and Nat Rab and Mugar Gianna, in which we ask people um, about their views of various hot political topics like climate change and genetically modified foods and nuclear power and some other things. And what we found, perhaps not surprisingly, is that the more people knew about the topic, the less they opposed they were to the political consensus, or sorry, the less opposed they were to the scientific consensus, right? That was a uh, Freudian slip there. Um, so that's not terribly surprising in the sense that the scientific consensus determines what objective knowledge is, right? So the more objective knowledge you have, the less opposed to the consensus you are. Here's what's perhaps a little more surprising, that the more you think you understand, the higher your subjective knowledge, the more likely you are to be opposed to the, to the scientific consensus. So it's this sense of understanding that gives people a kind of hubris. And what I've been arguing is that this sense of understanding comes from the fact that the people around you think they understand. So it's your cultural milieu more than anything that determines your sense of understanding and that determines whether or not you're opposed to the scientific consensus. And recently we've shown this even with COVID-19 um, issues like vaccination and mask wearing and social distancing. It turns out that if you want to predict whether somebody believes in wearing a mask, you know, don't find out how susceptible they are to COVID. Don't find out their risk category. That's not predictive of their behavior. What's predictive of their behavior is their political party. So what I've tried to argue in the past little bit is that a really key problem today that has to do with our attitude towards experts is that we lack intellectual humility. And we lack intellectual humility because we live in this illusion that we understand things better than we do. And all we have to do is try to explain in detail things to ourselves to discover, well, we don't really understand that well. And what I'd like to hypothesize, uh, this is a guess about the future, um, is that because so much information is now available to us through technology, the fact that we can answer any fact, almost any factual question at the touch of a few buttons with this thing we carry in our pocket, we really, we, the, the, the knowledge illusion has become even worse than it ever was. Right? The av easy availability of information makes us feel like we understand. It gives us the sense of understanding, which is really unjustified. And so this multiplies the problem of the failure to appreciate expertise. Right? And it might be why it is that I think both on the left and on the right, we see so many people today who are willing to dispense with the thoughts and advice of authority figures because they think they know everything. So, thank you. Thanks very much. That's Stephen Sloman from Brown University. I just wanted to pick up on uh, something you were saying uh, towards the end there, the idea that you're not really representing your own point of view. You're sort of you're representing the team or the tribe or the, the collective group of people that come from where you're coming from. And, and it, it does seem lately that people wake up in the morning and just put on a suit of opinions that covers everything. I mean, I even have to 
to to question your premise that we will listen to someone when they tell us it's raining outside now. I mean, didn't you recently have a president that had a very shiny inauguration day on a day when it was clearly, if you were watching TV, raining? I mean, it's 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 gotten that bad that even basic premises are, are questioned. But but the idea that that we we, we make moral judgments, we, we apply moral judgments to experts. And, and one of the reasons why they're, they're struggling with being accepted right now is because sometimes experts are wrong, a, an idea you were talking about earlier. I mean, the people who are anti-expert are also wrong all the time. Why don't we apply those same moral judgments to the ones who are turning us away from expertise when they are wrong so often? But we do. I mean. You know, most I, over fifty percent of America uh, can't stand the alternative facts group, right? I mean, it, the alt right, for instance, is is not popular. Look, Donald Trump is not popular in most of the country. So, you know, as long as they're on the other side, then we're willing to judge harshly. It's when they're on our side that we tend we tend not to judge at all is what we do, right? We just accept what people say um, without really evaluating it. So that's what it comes down to basically on every question now. What side are you on? From soup to well, Yeah, so I, I don't think it's on every question. Um, as I suggested, when you, we use our microwave ovens, we just sort of accept expertise, right? And I, I don't think there are big partisan differences on um, most everyday topics. You know, what's happened is that particular issues have become politicized. And what politicization means is that we've decided we're going to take our partisan view on the topic rather than thinking it through ourselves or rather than considering um, the view of the other side. Uh, you know, I, I, there, are, there are lots of communities we can belong to, right? So each of us might have, um, you know, our, a, a bridge community, a community that we recreate with and a community that and a religious community and an academic community and a community that we go car racing or jogging with, we all are, have multiple identities. And the, often the question that we have to pose is, what community are we seeing ourselves in at the moment for a particular question? So, you know, we've always depended on our communities of knowledge. I mean, we, we, we couldn't hunt and gather, you know, tens of thousands of years ago, if we didn't have a community to inform us and to do it with. Um, what may be different today is our willingness to take certain hot button issues and appeal to our partisan community as opposed to our other communities. Right. Well, I am at the point in the morning where I told Noreen I would hand things back to her. I, I can't believe it's actually exactly the time I told Noreen I would hand things back to her. I just wanted to say one, one other thing just before I do that um, for the breakout groups. I don't know if anyone else noticed, but I noticed that when uh, Stephen Sloman brought in the topic of critical theory, Harry Collins was really nodding on, on his monitor. So there, there could be something worth exploring there when we have all three of our experts together in the afternoon, if any of the breakout groups are interested in coming up with a question on that. But as I say, time to turn it back over to Noreen. Well, I think I'm back, there we are. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Um, to our panelists for their very thought provoking talks and um, Jim, for your moderation and indeed for the brilliant timekeeping. Uh, I'm sure the discussions are going to be very vibrant. Um, so let me explain how we'll proceed from here. Uh, we will have a break now until 11.15, so you can stretch, get much needed coffees, etc. cetera. Um, and at 11.15, um, at the moment, Sean is very busy putting you all into uh, one of 15 breakout groups. So you will all be assigned to a group. 
and these will open up and start at 1115. Um, each group has a moderator who will identify themselves to you and will help to guide the discussion, starting from a question that they have been given already, which has been provided, was provided in advance by uh, the panelists. So um, you will have 30 minutes to discuss this question in light of uh, the talks that we've just heard and, and anything you can bring into the discussion. Sean will give a five minute warning um, before uh, the, the session closes. The idea is that you come up with some questions or comments to return back to the panelists for them to then engage with in the Q&A, which will follow.
Uh, welcome back, everybody. I hope you had some uh, wonderful discussions and um, very much looking forward to our Q&A now. So I'll, um, I'll hand it over to Jim again. Thanks very much, Noreen. And uh, I have been receiving emails. I've got a whole whack of them in here from the various groups, so that's great. Um, It'll be interesting because I just spent uh, your breakout time with the panelists in another breakout room and came to realize the fact that uh, they are so much more <laughs> entertaining without a moderator um, that uh, I will try to step back as much as possible. Moderation is always a funny thing anyway, because I find generally when people um, ask for a moderator, what they are really looking for is the exact opposite of moderation, uh, but um, I can tell you that moderation with our three panelists is uh, is, is definitely not needed. They are, are well able to uh, keep it going on their own, and, and I'm hoping that they do keep it going on their own as I throw these questions out there for them. So uh, let's start with the first one I received, and um, uh, the question that the, this particular group was considering is this one, is it fair to say elites are protecting their own interests and views of the world when they accuse their opponents of being post-truth and science denialists? Why or why not? And uh, here's uh, what the group would like you to consider. Uh, they, they have come to the conclusion that we don't think that the elites are protecting their interests, but we'd like to find out how to deal with that issue properly. How are we going to be able to educate people as educators and help them use information properly and whether this will have any positive effect for our students in being able to distinguish what is good for them. So just, I guess that basic question of, of how to deal with this issue as an educator. Um, uh, perhaps Maya, you can kick us off on this one. Sorry, one second, I may have to make you a co-host again. Okay, here I am. Um, okay, I, it, it seems like there's a number of things that need to happen in order to get a little bit more familiarity with uh, sort of a, to, to address that problem. Um, okay, so let's say we accept that having a better understanding of science is, uh, is, is going to be generally good for society. And I, I think I will actually agree with that, even though I, understand that science policy involves many more things than scientific understanding itself. Uh, I think recognizing that science has merits and that science is more likely to lead us to good answers than other ways of doing things, uh, that, that, should be, uh, that should be accepted. So we do need science education in the schools, so educators should be doing that. But it seems that uh, you know, knowing sort of methods and, and practices in science doesn't quite capture what's, uh, what's uh, at stake here. It's probably got something to do, something more like what we call media literacy in K-12 now, where we, you know, teach students not to believe everything they read on the inter internet and uh, not to be overly persuaded by advertising. Uh, that kind of uh, teaching has been going on for years. We kind of need that around science too, recognizing that uh, that scientific claims are always couched with assumptions. It's worth unpacking some of those assumptions and, uh, and thinking about how, what kind of values are at stake. So um, I, I don't laugh at me for saying this, but philosophers of science say students in K-12 should be learning philosophy of science too, you know, in addition to learning about sort of chemistry and physics, but they need that sort of a social context for understanding how science arises, and uh, and it's in there it's, it's in there that we can start distinguishing what makes for good scientific claims and others because it's not just about methodology; it's also about how it's kept, how it's taken up, and how it is implemented for other things. So, a more social view of science should be part of that educational package.
Okay, now I have regained the ability to unmute myself, which was temporarily beyond my capacity. Uh, Stephen, assuming that your mic is live, would you like to uh, jump in on that? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, you can hear me, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess I want to end up at exactly the same place that Maya did, although I, I want to get there a little differently. Um, I think it's really important to distinguish individuals from institutions. So scientists are people and scientists suffer all of the same biases and other problems that everybody else does. Um, you know, we want our theories to be correct. It's hard for us to analyze data in a completely neutral way. Um, we have our dogmas, you know, they say that scientific theory doesn't change until old scientists die. And I, and I, and I, I think there's a lot to that, right? That we want to be right. Um, but the whole institution of science is designed to make truth win out, right? Like that's why we have peer reviewed publications. That's why we have seminars in which the norm is to challenge one another. Um, and it's not just scientists. I mean, there's lots of organizations that are designed this way. So my experience with philosophers is that they're more than happy to challenge one another. Courts of law are designed, at least in the West, are designed to allow people to challenge one another. And it's through that process that I think truth wins out. So, you know, there's, as, as we were discussing in the breakout room, there's tons of uncertainty, there's tons of ambiguity. Scientific theories are just theories. And all you can do is construct arguments for and against them and pick the one that explains the data best. But, you know, I, I do think as a field where we've managed to find ways to get beyond um, less than laudable human intentions. And Harry. You're... Yeah, okay. Well, I mean, the first thing that's, the first phrase that Stephen said, I agree totally. You've got to distinguish between individuals and institutions. Uh, and the reason that we need to teach our students to value science is because of its nature as an institution. Um, there are two things that follow from that. First of all, expect their science to be filled with, or, or at least occasionally, to reveal scandals and imperfections. In fact, it's worse than that. Expect the science you're interested in to be imperfect most of the time. The, the thing is, science sciences can get close to uh, a kind of perfect understanding of things so long as they're allowed to pick their own problems but in the public domain scientists can't pick their own problems they pick they, they're forced to try and consider society's problems and they're forced to try and consider politicians problems and when scientists have to deal with problems that they don't choose themselves, they'll often discover they're in domains where they can't be sure that they're getting to the right answers. So oddly enough, what we as citizens have to value when it comes to sciences in the public domains is imperfect sciences. Don't look for perfect sciences, look for imperfect sciences, but just realize that those imperfect sciences are going to give you better answers than more or less any other institution you can think of when it comes to considering the features of the natural world. And the reason that they're gonna give you better answers will occasionally be not that they have, shall we say, a track record of doing particularly well. I mean, weather forecasting is terrible, isn't it? And economics, is really all well economics ought to improve itself a bit actually economics is a bit of an exception to this but the reason is 
that fundamentally science is an institution, which I think Steve also said, which is after the truth of the matter. And it's hard to find institutions like that. Most institutions that we encounter in the modern world are after money, riches, fame, something like that. But at the heart of the matter, at the heart of it, science, scientists are after the truth of the matter. And that means they have to have some respect for integrity. And that's why we should value science in our societies. But this sets up a, another set of problems because if, if you if you are in, going after that sense of integrity, then you're acknowledging the uncertainty of most of what you're proposing and, and the changeableness of most of what you're proposing. S Stephen, you, you talked before in our breakup group about the difference between the uncertainty we're hearing from some scientists and the absolute certainty we're hearing from those who would dispute what those scientists are saying. And absolute certainty can be a very tempting thing for a crowd to hear. Yeah. Yeah, um, the other thing I said in the breakout room is that I actually think a really important role for experts is to make us less certain about things, is, is just to make absolutely clear how little we know about so many things. I think Harry's had a lot of experience with physics, but physics is actually very different than most scientists and that there's much more precision and much more certainty, at least in most areas of physics than in say, the social science or the life sciences that, that I've been involved in. Um, and, and so it's really important for experts to help the rest of society understand that for the most part, we're, we're walking in the dark and that's just the fact of it. And so, you know, one thing I mentioned in my talk was how it doesn't bother me that the WHO and the CDC have been changing their advice because it's a reflection of the fact that they're learning. And we're all learning. We've all learned a ton about aerosols and viruses and how they spread. Um, and you know, science, good science is constantly changing and appreciating imprecision and uncertainty and ambiguity and all of the, that fuzziness that makes it hard to figure things out. So Maya, I know you study vaccine hesitancy. How do you feel when you hear that very uncertainty, that whole process of learning that Stephen was just talking about coming from groups like the WHO or, or here in Canada from NASI. How do you feel when, when you hear those contradictory messages used as justification for vaccine hesitancy? Um, it, it's bound to happen. I mean, there's a whole area of science communications research that shows we need um, on the one hand, it's really helpful to have clear and consistent messaging to the publics, but science doesn't always operate that way. So you need to always couch uh, the claims with, uh, you know, justification, for example, why we're changing our minds about things. Uh, the, the NACU one is, is, is particularly troubling only because we're getting different, sorry, the, the one about the Oxford AstraZeneca in, uh, vaccines in Canada is because we're getting different messaging from politicians and then from our immunization uh, body who, to their credit, I think they've actually been consistent the whole time. They have always said the mRNA vaccines are preferable. Whether they're right to say that is a different thing, but they, but they uh, are consistent. Um, I, I wanted to add one more thing about the sort of messaging that both Steve and Harry are providing about what, what they'd like the publics to know about science is it might be helpful to make the distinction between um, settled science and emergent science. So when we learn a little bit of history of science, when we're you know even in high school, it's always about the scientific facts that have been established. And there's a less attention to how much work went into um, getting those facts to be established and taken as matters of truth. It, it, it is not the case that that one experiment suddenly changed everyone's minds about, let's say, washing our hands before you, before you deliver a baby or, or, uh, or uh, the rotation uh, of the earth around the sun. Instead, it's been, there's been uh, emergent information, there's dialogue, there's inconsistencies, um, and it often takes decades for even a small fact to be settled or by settled, I just mean widely accepted by the scientific community. So when we find ourselves with emergent scientific issues like a new vaccine, data about a new vaccine or about you know, how to control this new, uh, this new uh, virus, uh, we should absolutely expect that because this isn't 
the picture of science as its fact and then everyone should follow. Instead, the, the, the emphasis on the uncertainty and the knowledge that we're building is the right message. All right, well, let's go to another series of questions from one of the breakout groups. Uh, this is a group that was reflecting on the question, what does the will of the people mean? And uh, they, they concluded three things. One, the question itself is flawed and a misrepresentation as there isn't only one will of the people and the will of the people can be used as a weapon. Two, the will of the people is connected to the voice of the people, Vox Populi, and it depends on the question you ask to the people. Is the will of the people simply their desire? Following David Hume, is reason a slave to passion? And the third point they'd like to uh, have our panel consider is uh, a discussion of how the will of the people can be steered towards a return from living in a post-truth world. And if the panelists could give us some practical ideas on how we can return to a more robust respect for evidence-based knowledge society, which I guess is the nub, the, the main point that we're dealing with, the reason we're all here today. And if, if I could encourage you all to, to, to talk amongst yourselves, to pose questions to each other, I know you're all very curious about what the other thinks. And Harry, I'll, I'll, I'll kick out this big question with you. Thanks. Um, yeah, well, I certainly feel uh, it's a problem that I have to think very hard about. And uh, in recent work, uh, we came to a, an, an, a, a con not a conclusion. We came to the, the only thing we could think of, which is, and I mentioned it in my talk, more civic, civic education of the kind that we talked about in the last question, more teaching of how society works and how science works to people in schools, students in schools. Now, it's not much of a solution. Um, I wish we could think of something that looked more like turning a switch. And the chance of getting it into a, a, a as part of the policy of a political regime, especially if it's a malign political regime, seems seems almost zero. But I think that's the kind of thing we have to do fast. I think that's something that Biden, who seems to understand the issues at stake here, ought to be doing as fast as he can, getting more civic education into the meaning of society and the role of science within it and the role of experts within it as fast as possible because I think we are at a dangerous point in history. Uh, I'll, I'll, if I can add to that, it, it seems that having that kind of civic education would also lend itself to less um, overt politicization of science. So what got us to this sort of post-truth, post-fact moment where, you know, incidences like, um, uh, um, you know, the tobacco industry manufacturing, da manufacturing data to show that smoking wasn't really bad for us and convincing the publics for, for decades that smoking wasn't really bad for us. So, so it, because there's that sort of uh, view of science as, as absolutely factual, they were able to say, well, actually there's the consensus isn't so clear. And look, I found people can say things like, I found a paper, regardless of who created this, uh, this study, I found a paper that shows otherwise. So therefore, there must be some kind of doubt. The issue must not be settled. As if 100% certainty is the, the usual standard for science. And anything less than that means that we don't know anything. And, and of course, that can't be true. It's never been true about science. So the civic education that, that Harry's alluding to is also recognizing is, is part of that, is, is recognizing that there will always be uncertainty, all scientific claims are fallible and subject to revision. And once you do that, you have less um, opportunity for um, malevolent forces to start um, creating facts for, them, for, for their own use. And I, I mean, there's a certain amount of resonance in what you say for members of the media too. I mean, there are certain stories that they, they carry on you're presenting both sides of an issue and you're presenting both sides of an issue. And at some point, in some cases, you reach a point where you feel, okay, 
we're, we're, we're now getting in the way by presenting both sides of the issue. It's, it's time to stop presenting both sides of this particular issue. And I guess smoking is a good example. Um, climate change would be another. Uh, Stephen, what are your thoughts on this big question? So uh, you make an excellent point. I mean, I've always been a little skeptical of education as a solution in part because every academic thinks their area of specialization should be taught at the lowest levels, right? We should be devoting more time to what it is that we do. Um, but if by civics education, you mean cultural change, then I'm fully on board, right? I mean, I, and like the media are, are a critical part of that. So what we need is for people to care about evidence. That, and, and, we're, and I don't think we're gonna teach people in the classroom to care about evidence. We have to model it. We have to challenge them when they don't. We have to demonstrate, right, through direct experience that evidence can really help us and be informative. Um, can I get back to this question of the will of the people, which is a really interesting one. And in my field, we think about it in terms of this movement that sometimes that has this you know, scary name, uh, libertarian paternalism, which people don't like for a variety of reasons. But the general idea is that behavioral science can be used to nudge social policy in such a way that you're not reducing the number of choices people have. You're given, giving people as much freedom of choice as possible. In that sense, it's libertarian, but it's paternalistic in the sense that you nudge certain things, right? And um, so, and then, you know, the, the most famous example of this is nudging people to become organ donors by having them um, sign the back of their driver's licenses, say, if they don't want to be a do an organ donor, as opposed to if they do, right? And it turns out that if you change things so that you don't have to do something in order to be an or organ donor, you get four times as many organ donors as, as vice versa. So this whole field raises the question, well, what can we nudge and what can't we nudge? There's been some acceptance that organ donation is okay to nudge because 80% you know, of Americans, and I suspect 80% of Canadians support or, or even greater numbers, support organ donation. But there are a lot of issues in which there isn't such clear support. So it seems to me we just, we have to be very, very selective about what we as experts, as scientists, as an elite are going to push, right? Like freedom is important. It's really, really important. And basically what it means to me is that should be the default. And until we have an issue in which there's really a lot of consensus that we want society to change in a, in a certain direction, we should just leave it alone and let people make their own decisions. So, so how that, do you how do you determine how do you determine whether that issue is at hand? I mean, presumably you would agree that climate change would be one of those issues that would meet that bar. But even five years ago, um, in the media, we were we were both sidesing all over climate change. I mean, the, the, the determination that, that, uh, that everyone uh, had to go in a certain way is fairly recent. Yeah. No, it, it's hard for sure. Um, so, you know, and your example illustrates the point because I'm not so sure you're right that there really was such debate five years ago. The sense I have is that almost all scientists thought that climate change was anthropomorphic and, and something we should do something about. But there's an industry that was acting as if there, there was a debate. And, and this is, how, is what happened with cigarettes too, right? There was a purported debate that was actually industry versus everyone else. But you know, de deciding that that is the dynamic is itself difficult. So that itself requires some social science, right? To figure out what it is that people want. Look, sometimes it's obvious. I mean, we all want this pandemic to be over, don't we? Right, we, we all want most people to live above the poverty line. I mean, there are, there is a lot of consensus. There's a lot of commonality of value. And I think we can start there. 
but I mean, what's obvious for some is not necessarily obvious for others. I mean, we have some recent polling da data that we've done here in this province that shows a fairly substantial percentage of Albertans are, are, are very much against all of the lockdown measures, want people to have uh, freedom of choice to be able to make up their own mind. We see anti-mask and anti-lockdown protests quite often, and yet, the, the key to unlock that door, the vaccine, these are the very same people who are most resistant to signing up and getting vaccinated and actually being able to end the lockdown. I mean, Harry, when, when you see these kinds of, of relationships between points of view that on the surface seem so counterintuitive, how, how do you apply the science to that? Well, let me just, I mean, I put my hand up because I wanted to say something. Because I was really surprised at the, one of the things that Stephen just said, because I thought earlier in the discussion, that's way back in the early part of it, he was agreeing with me and my model of society, which sees people formed depending on the groups that they, they belong to. And yet all of a sudden he's come out with a bit of rhetoric about freedom being so important. He's forgetting about things like tolerance of intolerance. He's forgetting about things like, well, at least how it seems from this side of the Atlantic, when one looks at the United States of America, the extraordinary debate about guns in America and about capital punishment. We've had no capital punishment in the UK for decades now, but it's not because of that's how the public wants it. We know perfectly well if you open that question to the public, Politicians would know how to get elected by standing on a platform of capital punishment. But nevertheless, one can still say, but we don't want it. And that's the difficult problem for Steve to solve. It's not, and it isn't solved just by saying, let's give everybody more freedom. I think this business of more freedom is an illusion. Yeah, Harry, I feel like you're trying to pick a fight. Um... Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, that's what people <laughs> like in these debates. I mean, I, I think what I actually said was a lot more subtle than you're suggesting. Uh, wh what I said was, um, it's, it's hard to determine the will of the people, right? And there are lots and lots of issues in which there's not consensus. And then Jim gave us some examples of, uh, of how even for issues which you think there might be consensus, it turns out that it's not so clear. Uh, and, and all I said was, in those cases where there's lack of clarity, then uh, you know I think it's important that we don't foist our values and procedures on society. That's all. Other than that, I agree with you about gun control. Actually, I mean, on any of these issues, I have my own particular voice, but I think we have to respect that of everybody. I should just let you know, if, if you're putting your hand up and I, I'm not calling to you, it's because I don't have all of you on my, my screen. I generally have uh, whoever's speaking and then a few other random participants. Um, Maya, I wanted to, to, to just before we leave this section, talk about two words that have come up quite a bit, um, uncertainty on the one hand and evidence on the other. We've heard about how crucial both of those things are to the pursuit of science and the acceptance of that science, but how, how do you, in a sense, make those two words that, that seem to be such opposites come together? Um, and the connection there is, at least around scientific evidence, is that there's a consistent fallibility in science and the and revisability, the idea that science, this is supposed to be a strength of science, that it is revisable in light of new evidence. So we don't, even though we use the language of facts, the facts su suggest that it is something is static and unchangeable. And at least in theory, every scientific claim is revisable. Some will probably never be revised just because so much has been they work so well and that so much has built up on it, but we don't talk about 100% certainty in, uh, in science. And that may not be too important when we talk about, you know, uh, fundamentals around in, in uh, let's say, uh, around, you know, theory of gravity, but it does matter when we get to the, you know, the, the higher order, the, uh, the, the more unsettled and the newer and, and, and emergent uh, science. 
Yeah, the reason the reason I just wanted to sort of underline that is because it does seem to be so important to a lot of the questions yeah. that are, are feeding this conversation today, particularly those related to COVID-19, that the kind of ever-changing nature and, and the not knowing what to believe and then the reversals and then the head exploding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yes. so I, I just wanted to spend a little bit of time on that before I move to our, our next question from our other breakout groups. Um, this one, um, it, it, it starts off like this. Over the last year, it has, it has often looked like it's the general public refusing to accept the advice of experts and more like our elected representatives refusing to accept that advice. Does the knowledge illusion work the same way for elected representatives or do we need to acknowledge other forces, political, economic, at work when they dismiss expert advice? I think that's a a really pertinent question uh, here, at least in this part of the world right now. Uh, and Maya, you're you're up on the screen. Why don't you why don't you take the first crack at this one? I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? I, I don't think I, I caught the whole thing. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase. It, uh, this group says that lately it's, it, it looks like it looks less like it's the general public refusing to right. accept the advice of experts, and more like it's our elected representatives who are refusing to accept the advice of experts, and, uh, and they're wondering about the political considerations that roll into all of this. Yeah, there, there is certainly three parts to this. There's the political leadership, there's the scientific advice coming from our various scientific tables and our, uh, and our um, public health officers. And, and then there are the publics too. So um, uh, keep, keeping with uh, Steve's work about how knowledge claims become sort of I think his word was tribalized, where we, where we, uh, you, certain groups start to accept certain things because, a, because uh, those views become part of their political views and their ideological uh, and their ideological world views. It becomes the case that sometimes disagreeing with the leadership is part of the work that you do, and certainly um, uh, we we are getting a kind of um, in Canada we're seeing the sort of. Um, conservative governments that are not listening to their advisory groups. That's happening in Alberta. That's certainly happening in Ontario where I live. And we've got the publics that are, if they are you know, unhappy with government, they might say, well, these are the, the scientists are the people that we should be listening to. Um, I don't think they're asking for a technocracy, but they are asking for uh, more evidence informed policy. So, so we're seeing all those things. We're seeing members of the public that don't want to follow the scientific recourse and also members of the public that don't like the political recourse either. And of course, we would like it if the politicians and the scientists were a little bit more unified. I mean, that's why we have these scientific advisors in the first place, because they're actually supposed to be helpful. And when they're ignored by politicians, well, we wonder why, you know, why did we do all this work anyway? Now, Harry, I'm not, uh, not, totally clear about the situation in the UK. I know in, in Stephen's country, they just lost an administration that seemed to make a proud, boastful point of disagreeing with scientists. And now that that administration is no longer in power, it, it's fallen to the right wing news media to, to bash scientists in the US. What's the situation like in the UK? Is there, is there that same kind of relationship between, uh, between governing bodies, political parties, and science, that same kind of distrust or misrepresentation? No. Um, the, um, I mean, everybody applauds the vaccine rollout in the UK, and uh, pretty well everybody in the, sorry, there's vaccine, a certain amount of vaccine hesitancy in the UK, but it's a, it's a small number of people, and uh, people in the UK kind of snigger at the French who've got about 40% vaccine hesitancy or something like that, uh, and are suffering from it as well. Um, and uh, Johnson, uh, the prime minister, um, who is, a, in my view, a really wretched person, uh, nevertheless has proclaimed that he's been, him and his government have been following the science and they've been claiming that from the outset of the uh, pandemic, it wasn't true at the beginning. I mean, he delayed lockdowns for far too long with the result that the UK had uh, a greater proportions of deaths from COVID than any other European country for a long time. 
I don't know what's happening now that our vaccine rollout has been so successful. So uh, we're in the UK, we're in, in the UK in particular, I don't think we're too worried about anti-science, um, but we're worried about it in other important nations such as the US, uh, because our future, I mean, it's not, there are two ways about it. Our future is tied to the future of the US. Mm. It's curious, Stephen, how the, the, the suit of clothing that people put on in North America that, you know, sort of starts with your right wing beliefs and your your climate change denialism and all of the, the other little pieces of the outfit that you put on in North America. It also includes a pretty strong aversion to masks and uh, and anti-COVID measures in the UK. It doesn't appear to. And it, 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 that's interesting to me. Mm. So I, I think um, the two countries probably differ in terms of the dynamics of their discourse. In the, in the US, um, you know, what scares me the most um, is that the extremists have completely taken over the discourse, right? And, and when I say the extremists, I mean on both the right and the left. So most of the debate you see is between I, what I judge to be a fairly small percentage of the population of either end. And I think most people are actually sort of moderate and in the middle, but they've been cut out of the conversation. And I, and I think a big reason that they've been cut out is because they understand the complexity of the topics they're discussing. Whereas extremists, control the conversation because they're able to simplify, right? Simplification is the key to controlling the conversation. And so politicians do it in large part by not talking about details, not talking about the way to roll things out and the policy implications. Rather, they talk about sacred values. They talk about the things that are most important to them that they care about the most. And thus they get to sort of abstract from all those messy details. And that's really what fosters this illusion, right? And that's also what allows them to connect to large swaths of the population because they also accept those values, even if some of them appreciate that life is more complex than those values capture. So Maya, let me take that, that last scenario sketched out by Stephen with extremists on both sides, the right and the left controlling the conversation. And let me plug in one other question from this great uh, breakout group. How does an expert interface with the public domain without being attacked? Um, I don't know that there's one way to do it. There's been some work on, on how to get expert assessments better taken up by the public. And there's been some experimental work where they've tried using a diverse body of experts to try to uh, get people on board with a certain message. So there's been experimental work where um, they uh, get, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll pick people based on their demeanor and their dress and sometimes they'll make up a story around it and they'll get, let's say, um, uh, let's say you'll get a, a conservative leaning person or someone who uh, appears to be like that to talk to conservative groups about, I don't know, the HPV vaccine. And there's been success around that. And the reason for that is it, it, there's sort of psychology and, and work on, on what pe makes people trust an expert. The, the finding is, is that it's not that people are necessarily against expertise or against the idea that people have knowledge that they don't. So I actually, I don't, I don't agree with that claim that people think no one that that everyone thinks they know as much as everyone else there's you know there's some evidence that we overestimate for sure but the problem is when they think the experts don't hold the same values that they do so when you find someone that are let's say from a certain community they are able to talk to their community more successfully i'll give you an example uh, I, we keep talking about the states I, I hate when that happens but i'm going to use an example from the states uh catherine hayhoe is an evangelical climate scientist. She is Canadian, by the way, but she lives in the States. And she's been very successful talking to 
evangelicals like herself, who are generally ideologically committed to not believing climate change is true, but because it's coming from her, because it's coming from someone that shares their values, they are more open to that discussion. And we're, we're yeah. seeing this around vaccines too. There's a lot of work happening in Canada and elsewhere around um, uh, reaching out to vaccine more, to vaccine resistant communities speaking to people from their community about it. So we call them vaccine ambassadors now to, to let's say go into uh, uh, immigrant or racialized communities that are more resistant to vaccines. You get people from the community to speak to them because they're not necessarily going to hear the message in the same way when it comes from the sort of orthodox experts that they don't think know them and don't uh, and they don't trust them to actually share the things that are, are uh, important to them. It's It's, it's a strange situation, though. It's, I mean, we're, we're, we're essentially babying groups of people, mm. you know? I mean, if I was an expert with a point of view to share, I think the last thing I'd want to do is step out into that stage the way that, uh, that you and Stephen are describing it. Uh, it's hard to do. I, I look at our... If I'm trying to talk to evangelical Texans and I'm not an evangelical Texan. I mean, it, it doesn't exactly uh, look like my point of view is going to be welcomed with open arms. Um, that's probably true. And that says something and that tells us that, uh, you know, the publics, I, I, I'm sympathetic to the publics that are sometimes not sure about who to trust in terms of expert sources. You know, the, the letters next to your name aren't enough. There is, if, if experts are giving advice on technical matters, we, the publics, are not in a position to judge their claims to be accurate. At best, we can do character assessments of those people. And we do it all the time. We decide this person is someone that looks like a person that I trust, or this person has a similar background to me. So we make these moral assessments. And that's often what all we can do is, is the second order assessments uh, mm. of whether the person is seems to be trustworthy, is likely to be speaking honestly, and then we follow their recommendations. And that's a difficult thing to do, knowing that we could be misled or we could be harmed by a, a corrupt expert source. And, and that's so, happened before, it's happened, it, it could happen again. So Harry, when you talked earlier about how you were less than completely satisfied with the solution that, that you and, and your colleagues came up with, the idea of civil education, this seems like a particular aspect of this area where civil education, if it is going to do anything, is going to take a very, very long time. Yeah. Um, but I wish I could think of something else. You know, one one wants something where you can turn a switch. Uh, but uh, you kind of pill a pill or something. A kind of pill, or or you you know maybe if I had billions of dollars and uh, owned a a broadcasting company, that might do it. But I'm afraid all the wrong people seem to own those things. But if you had billions of dollars, you probably wouldn't care as much as you do now, Harry. Mm, don't know. So, so you've you've stepped out on the stage with opinions that have been you've had had those opinions pushed back on. Uh, how how do you feel about the, the 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 just that sort of just the sort of reality that experts find themselves in today, where if they're going to say anything. Um, that isn't exactly what the audience expects, then basically they're, they're, they're probably ruining their, at least their social media lives for, for months, if not years. Their social media, if that's addressed to me, I don't use it. Uh, I, don't, I don't use it either, so. <laughs> uh, but, um, but it's a tough call to make right now, to, to take, let, to take um, an opposing point of view. Let me put it this way, as an academic, what I've discovered <clears throat> is that I despise other academics whose motivations are to gain, are primarily to gain audience appreciation. You know, uh, the one comforting thing, one of the comforting things in, in, that I find in life is as soon as I, I'm having an argument with somebody in an academic forum, it wouldn't be, a, probably not on Zoom, but in, in some hall somewhere and the things they say are designed to get the audience on their side I immediately know that they're doing the wrong thing and therefore by default I'm doing the right thing 
here's something else to consider. And Stephen, let me start with you on this one because uh, this, this is quite interesting. Um, this came up from one of the other groups and I've been getting so many questions here that I'm, I'm starting to cherry pick because I can see we're almost running out of time, but this is a good one. Uh, should we better regulate the media to curb or even ban those outlets that are clearly peddling untruths? Stephen? Yeah. Well, look, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, and so I'm not in a position to decide the best way to handle the media. My, my suspicion is the best way is to be able to sue them if they lie, right? I mean, probably libel and slander laws could be more effective than anything else, and a little bit of that is actually going on. But, um, the Dominion well, Voting Machines uh, company. Right. The Dominion Voting Machines Company seems to have had some uh, some yes, effect doing that exactly. lately. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. and you know, you do get the sense that Fox News is being more careful now than than it was previously, because uh, it'll cost them money. And you know, unfortunately, a lot of the pushing of um, bad information, myths, and disinformation is about making money. Um, can I just say it's kind of like a game of whack a mole, though? With I mean, one you know you. you you shut down one outlet and another one pops up immediately and you, you, there's no way you could keep track of it all, right? Yeah, but remember the listeners also then have to keep track, right? And, and so maybe in, in the end, there's some marginal gain. Can, can I just say something about the earlier issue quickly? Um, I, I think it's important. So I take this community of knowledge idea really seriously, right? And, and broadcasting information, we have a tendency to think that all, what you have to do is give people the right information, right? Give them the right education. Education generally is focused on individuals. I think you're right, uh, Jim, that it's a sad fact that, that people don't sit and listen to scientists um, and take everything they say as, as God's truth. Um, and maybe for good reason, right? It's in large, because scientists don't always know what they're talking about and sometimes they're wrong and, and we should have different sources of information. So the fact that you do need someone like you who's, uh, who's talking to you in order to be convincing may be sad in a way, but that's the way the world is. We are, I think, tribal. And it's not necessarily bad. Right? So what it means is that when you want to persuade, when you want to reach out to people, don't think that you can just give them the facts on a platter. Rather, appreciate that you have to speak to, to a, a community, to an ideology, to a way of thinking. And people do respond to evidence. Right? If people believe something that implies X and you show them very clearly that X is not true, people feel the need to explain that. And, and that's sort of the saving grace, right? It's we do respond to evidence and that's the key, I think. I, I wanna wrap this up because uh, we are quickly running out of time by um, actually going back to a question that Harry asked the other two panelists in our little non-breakout breakout room. And, and Harry, I'm paraphrasing you, but you said something like, I, I was the only one of the three that really talked about how scared I was. Aren't you too scared? Maya, are you scared? Um, I, am I scared? Um, I don't see our situation as a good one. I, would, uh, I think everyone would uh, agree on that. Um, uh, I, I wonder what it's going to take to get people more unified such that we could actually have um, agreement on things. So, I, so I, I've already said, I don't think expertise is dead. I don't think it's a matter of believing science, but I do think we've got so much social division that even our science has become politicized. But this is my science, that's your science. And when I think about the kind of uh, social and civic work that needs to be done to create more unity. I'm, I'm, uh, um, I feel a little overwhelmed because I don't know that we have the resources and uh, desire to do it. We seem to splinter even in during a pandemic, which was the time to bring to come together. If ever uh, we we are splintering more, and that that uh, um, uh, that causes me a lot of distress. So that's a hard maybe. <laughs> Stephen, are you scared? 
Um, I was scared on election day in the U.S. Uh, I, I'm actually feeling much better now. I, you know, things are, are going, are much more to my liking now. Um, and I don't know, I'm not really scared because I don't know what the future holds, you know? I mean, it's really hard to make predictions, especially about the future, as they say. And I, I, I find society turning on a dime every five minutes. So I'm frustrated, I'm annoyed by polarization. Um, I'm not sure I'm any more scared than I have been at any other time in my life. Right. Now, Harry, I know, I know how terrified you were on election night because you mentioned it in your presentation a little earlier. How are you feeling today, four or five months later? Not much less scared uh, because uh, in spite of uh, uh, some of the opinion poll figures that Stephen produced, as far as I understand, there's still a huge proportion of the US population and apparently the Calgary population um, who hold the kind of views that I think are a pathway to a collapse of pluralist democratic societies an invitation to populism and therefore collapse of pluralist de democratic societies. So as a parent, you know, the thing I worry about is, is what sort of world are my kids gonna live in and my grandchildren gonna live in? And uh, I, yeah, I am pretty scared still. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I am disappointed that, uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm not talking about Maya and Stephen, but my colleagues in general in the academic world aren't putting all their time into thinking about these issues and trying to find a solution because I don't think the solution I suggest is a particularly good one. I mean, it would work, as you said, but it would take a very long time. Uh, I, I think that's the problem we've got. That's the problem of the age. And it's being made worse and worse by social media. Well, Noreen, I, I never said I'd throw it back to you on an optimistic note, <laughs> but I am throwing it back to you now. Thanks to all three of you. Uh, terrific conversation. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you, Jim. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. I'm very sorry we have to draw mm -hmm. our uh, discussion to a close. Uh, I know for sure that not all the groups were able to have their responses considered. They're just... Uh, there wasn't enough time um, and clearly we could go on for a very long time discussing uh, these issues. Um, so I think I just want to um, thank you all so much uh, for, for joining us today. And, and while it's a, a shame we couldn't meet in person, of course, we're very grateful to your commitment to the event in this online format um, and for the wonderful discussions that emerged. Um, and I'm sure you will all join me in heartily thanking first our advisory council for setting us on the path which led to today's topic, uh, our three panelists, uh, Professors Harry Collins, Maya Goldenberg and Stephen Sloman for giving us so much food for thought and the benefit of their considerable expertise. Um, also to our moderator, Jim Brown for so ably keeping things moving and brilliantly keeping everything on time. Uh, to Sean Lindsay, the CIH coordinator for managing the technical side of things so beautifully, for our moderators for um, dealing uh, with the breakout groups uh, and managing that task uh, for us, and of course to all the participants for your committed engagement to this important discussion. Um, because of course open and civil dialogue on challenging issues remains key to the democratic process, as I think we um, have shown here today. Uh, we will actually, uh, when you leave, um, oh no, I can't, actually I can't remember if it's gonna happen when you leave, but we will be following up with a survey about today's event. Um, and there's an incentive uh, to answer it. You will be put in a draw for one of the panelists books. Um, so I hope that will um, help um, convince you to take the time to respond as your feedback is vital for our future planning. So please uh, also visit the CIH website at arts.ucalgary.ca slash CIH 
and subscribe to our mailing list if you have not already done so to find out more about upcoming CIH hosted events and how you can further support the Institute should you be so minded. We very much appreciate your support in whatever form it comes and hope to see you all again at our upcoming events. Thank you again very much for all your contributions. Enjoy your weekend and above all, keep very safe and well. Thank you.